Asking about skeletal muscle is another favourite of examiners in the FRCS um, examination. Um, when you're asked about skeletal muscle, again, you should have a logical thought process and think of skeletal muscle as its macroscopic and microscopic structure. So the macroscopic uh, structure can broadly be uh, divided into uh, parallel muscles or pennate type muscles. Um, the, the parallel type muscles can be further divided into three types. They could either be strap, they could either be fusiform, or they could either be a fan shaped. The pennate is more easy to remember. It could either be unipennate, bipennate, or multipennate. And um, it's probably worthwhile just remembering a example or an example of each type of muscle. So uh, an example of strap muscle is sartorius. Uh, an example of fusiform muscle is the biceps. Fan shape would be pec major. Uh, a unipennate uh, muscle would be the palmar interossei. Uh, a bipennate uh, type of muscle would be the rectus femoris. And a multipennate uh, example would be deltoid. So after you've laid this out to the examiner, the examiner already knows that you have a type of structure. But then to go one step further, you can talk about the microscopic structure. And this is probably where you're going to get most of your marks. And um, this is probably where it's more important. So um, just broadly speaking, the, the muscle or, or all skeletal muscle is uh, surrounded by uh, a layer of epimysium. Uh, within the epimysium, you have large, larger bundles uh, called fascicles uh, or, or muscle, muscle fascicles. Uh, and these, um, within these muscle fascicles, they are uh, surrounded by perimysium. And uh, the, the perimysium surrounds within it your muscle fibers. So, so these are your muscle fibers here. And your muscle fibers are surrounded by endomysium. And then within your muscle fiber, which is surrounded by endomysium, it again, you have even smaller structures called your myo fibrils. Now to zoom in further, within your myofibrils, you can draw out uh, your, your sarcomeres. And this is where this kind of question will lead on to. So you can zoom in to your myofibril and then start drawing your myosin, which are your thick chains, and your actin, which are your thin chains. So the, this is your actin in between your myosin. You don't have to draw that, that many. Um, and this is in between. And then on the other side, you have the same thing. And then this is where you start labeling uh, your, your sarcomere. So on the thin chains of your actin, you have your Z line. And you have, so I've drawn here, uh, two portions of the Z line. And from one Z line to the other Z line is your sarcomere. Okay. And then in the middle of your myosin, which are your thick chains, is your M line. And then you can start uh, labeling the other bands. So myosin only is your H band. And if I just draw here the other side of the, the myosin, because then 
is easier to understand. Here, where you have actin only, is your I band. Now, the way I remember this is that myosin is thick, so the letter H is thicker than the letter I, and actin is thin. Where you have both actin, sorry, actin and myosin, this is where you have your A band. And the right way I remember that is because A stands for all, it includes your actin and your myosin. So this is your sarcomere labeled up. Then you can go one step further. So how does muscle contraction actually happen? Well, if you zoom in here to your myosin and your actin where they overlap, what actually happens is you have your myosin coming on top of your actin filament and on your myosin you have two chains. You have a heavy chain which gives off a bulbous structure such as this and then you have a lighter chain which gives another bulbous structure. You can go one step further that there's a, there's a neck portion called the S2 and the head portion called the S1 of the myosin. On the actin itself, you have a few components. So first of all, you have your myosin binding site. So myosin binding site on your actin. And this is where your myosin S1 head will bind onto. However, at rest, it is normally covered by another structure called tropomyosin. On the actin filament, you also have another structure called troponin, which comes in three, uh, three separate binding proteins. So you have a troponin C, a troponin I, and a troponin T. Okay, C, I, and T. So when you have your action potential coming down from your neuromuscular junction, and, your, uh, and, and, and this uh, causes your sarcolemma uh, to um, depolarize and you have your uh, depolarization coming down the sarcolemma in down through the T-tubules and that releases uh, calcium from your sarcoplasmic reticulum. So when you get release of calcium, your calcium comes down and it binds onto the C portion of your troponin. That binding causes a conformational change to the tropomycin in that it moves away from the myosin binding site on the actin, which then allows your myosin to bind on to the myosin binding site. This process is actually ATP driven. So this requires energy. So you have ATP causes this head to bind on, and this releases ADP and inorganic phosphate. So this not only just occurs here, but it occurs all along the actin and myosin crossovers along the whole of the sarco sarcomere in all these myofibrils, and it all acts as one. That's how muscle contraction happens. You can go one step further and talk about the relationship between the force of contracture of the muscle and the actual length of the muscle. And you can draw the examiner a graph. So you've got length on the x-axis and force of contraction on the y-axis. And what uh, what this shows is it, it actually forms a, a graph like this. And to explain it to the examiner, you have three portions to this graph. And I draw two vertical dotted lines here where you have typically in the middle of the graph where you have a plateau region where you get the optimal, um, the, the optimal length to allow force of contraction. On the right side of the graph, 
here you have too much length or too much tension on your muscle and here your your muscle length is too short so to explain this further what this really shows is um, if you imagine if your muscle fibers are too short that means that your um, that your H band is too short so if your actin is overlapping too much meaning that your H band is very short you won't have any space for your your actin and myosin to contract to to overlap each other and that's why you don't get very much uh, force contraction to apply that clinically that's why it's really important to get your abductor tension right when you're doing hemiarthroplasties of the hip or total hip replacements to refunction the hip abductors because if your offset is too small um, it means that your overlap is is too short and therefore your abductors won't generate um, uh, an optimal amount of contraction on the other hand if if you tension too much and your H band is is too too long it means that you don't have any crossover at all uh, between your actin and your and your myosin and you, you just don't get enough of your actin uh, of your myosin binding onto your actin to cause any contraction uh, of, of significance so you have this optimal region somewhere in the middle uh, where where, where the, the, the length isn't too short or or, or too long so in summary that's um, that's skeletal muscle